Welcome back. Still COVID-19 360. And now we're going to give you the figures uh, from the world. Yes, and so globally, we've recorded 5.6 million confirmed coronavirus cases, and that is from 188 countries globally. And our recoveries now are over 2.3 uh, million, but let me give you a little breakdown of the country by country and also how uh, some of the countries are doing when it comes to the highest. And so we have 5,606,925. And the United States is leading with 1,681,408. And for the United States, like I mentioned before, we went on the break. Uh, their health workers are being affected the most with over 62,000 health workers being affected and over 300 deaths when it comes to the health workers and so the united states stands still first and when we go to brazil brazil has 391,222 and for the biggest city in brazil which is sao paulo um their, their mayor is saying that if care is not taking they will be overwhelmed so much because they are now overwhelmed at about 90 percent of their health facilities are not able to take in uh, the coronavirus cases that are being brought in the health facilities and so if care is not taking they may not be able to even admit more and that will be a really huge issue and uh, russia comes in third with 370,680 confirmed coronavirus cases and when you look at the countries recording the highest numbers, these are countries recording uh, over 50,000 cases. That is the United States in 24 hours. Uh, Russia is coming in third, recording over 11,000 cases in 24 hours. The United Kingdom comes in fourth with 266,000 599 coronavirus cases and Spain with 236,259 and looking at the figures some of these countries are recording they are even easing down on some of the restrictions and for Germany for instance with the number of cases they have they've eased on restrictions football has begun and so uh, it looks like Ghana right here maybe we may be following suit and then opening up some of our churches and stuff, but we're looking forward to that. But now let's look at the recoveries globally. 2,301,727 recoveries. The United States is leading with 384,902 recoveries. Germany comes in second with 162,690. Now let's go to Brazil with 158,500 and 93 recoveries spain with 150,376 recoveries italy 144,658 and then russia with 142,208 recoveries now let's look at the deaths uh, globally and then find out how the uh, global stage is looking like so um, with the over 188 countries that have recorded cases we have 350,862 deaths with most of the deaths coming in from the United States with 98,920 and that is really close to the 100,000 mark and the United Kingdom comes in second with 37,130,000 deaths Italy 32,900 and 55 deaths and let's move on to france with 28,533 deaths spain 27,117 deaths and now the global projection is at 6 million and so um, hopefully we don't go past that mark we're looking at the number of tests being done globally and the figures we're recording and looking at the united states alone with over 1 million cases if these uh contacts are also traced to other contacts it means that our figures globally will be going high and so right here on COVID 19 360 we'll do well to keep you updated on all the figures and we'll be bringing you the figures in africa as well and bella well yeah hmm interesting i must say it's not getting yeah. any better um well our recovery is uh, it looks promising exactly but let's be optimistic we let's, are <laughs> let's be optimistic I, I believe that we have it under control and so gradually we'll get rid of this pandemic or at least um learn to have it under control that's the most important but there's still some more information that will be given to you before we cross over 
to our doctors via Skype. And uh, first of all, we'll clear that misconception about infectivity tests and whether that should become the main form of testing to ascertain whether people with the virus are still or could still be infectious or not. And a few other questions will come your way. And again, later we'll be speaking to a mother of a 14-year-old autistic uh, child. We want to find out how she's been teaching her child uh, while schools have been shut and what kind of help she can offer to other parents who may find themselves in similar conditions um, as well. But um, we have some numbers for you. Well, yes, we'll give you the numbers from Africa and then we'll speak to our doctors. Yes, yeah, so on the African continent, our case count now stands at 119,000 and even counting with recoveries at 48,367 and deaths at 3,575. Now let's give you the case count country by country and South Africa is leading with 24,264 and South Africa has done over 500,000 tests and their recoveries is at 12,741 and Egypt comes in second with 18,756 and Egypt has steadily you know racked up the numbers so fast that it is it is quite unassuming but they started off uh, barely two three weeks ago with 6,000 cases and now they are at 18,000 almost at par with South Africa but their recoveries uh, stands at 5,027 Algeria is third with 8,697 cases, with a recovery standing at 4,918. Now, Nigeria uh, steadily climbing up when it comes to the chart on the African continent at number four with 8,344 and 2,300 and 85 recoveries. In Morocco, 7,577 confirmed coronavirus cases and recoveries at 4,881. Ghana comes in with 7,117 and this is our latest update with recoveries at 2,317 and our recoveries. Uh, we got this figure uh, from over 220 recoveries that have been added. Cameroon, 5,362 and recoveries at 1,996. Now let's look at the test done and also the population of uh, some of uh, the countries on the African continent and also the test per million that they've been able to uh, conduct. For Mauritius, they've done 104,639 tests. And Mauritius is one of the countries that is having reinfections. And uh, also the, the island nation is having reinfections. Looking at the tests that have been done in their population as well with over 1.2 million, that is 1,271,519 people. And a test per million is at 82,291. Djibouti has 23,140,000 uh, tests. And if you remember, Djibouti is one of the countries that is recording the highest number of recoveries on the African continent. We brought you that list um, last week. And with a population of over 986,206, the test per million is 23,000. 455. Now let's look at South Africa. Uh, they've done 605,991 tests as of this morning with a population of over 59 million. That is 59,216,090. And the test per million is at 10,230. Now let's look at Botswana with 17,631,000 tests done with a population of 2,345,000. 5,548 and the test per million 7,513. When you come down here to Ghana this morning, our test done stands at 203,383 and our population is 30,989,647. Nine and our test per million is 6,560 and then Gabon also has done 11,340 tests with a population of 2,220,204 and the test per million is 5,108,000. 5, Rwanda uh, is last with 60,000 tests done, uh, 60,443 tests with a population of over 12,918,000. 1,194 and tests per million at 4,600. 
and 79. Now let's look at the deaths on the African continent. Uh, sadly, Egypt, you know, comes in first and uh, looking at the chart, um, Egypt has 797 deaths from the over 18,000 tests they've been able to, uh, 18,000 cases they have. Algeria second with 617. South Africa with over 24,000 coronavirus cases has a death toll of 524. Nigeria coming in with 249 deaths. Morocco, 202. Cameroon with 175. And Ghana with the least on the African continent so far. When, when you look at this chart, with 34 deaths and the last two uh, were, were, were recorded as a, the last updates that we were given. And so this is how the figures looks on the African continent and also globally. You out there can get more information on the various websites as well. And also on 3news.com, there's more updates there. My name is Anita Ikeo This is COVID-19 360. We're going for a quick break. When we come back, more conversations with our experts as they are standing by. You don't want to miss out on this. Do stay. Welcome back. It's the COVID-19 360. And just quick information. So the senior minister, Yaosafu Mafo, has said that governments will have a final round of meetings to determine how the easing of restrictions will be done to restore economic life. And he said the meeting will climax a series of engagements with experts and other identifiable groups who've been making inputs on how to relax the restrictions which have affected economic and social life. And so today, as we interact with our experts, we'll be finding out from them um, how they think this should go and, um, you know, in terms of easing the restrictions, what really should be done. But even before that, let me introduce you to my guest, just in case this is your first time watching COVID-19 360. Over the past few months, we've had Dr. Bertha Sewa Aya, infectious disease specialist, and Dr. Newman Arthur, clinical psychologist, provide expert advice on everything concerning COVID-19. And they join us again this morning. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good morning. And I hope you're doing well. Yes. And I go All right. Now, also, we, we have an avid viewer, and he's also a virologist. Uh, sometimes we get to speak to him on air to explain a few things to us, and that's Sebastian Eugene Arthur. Now, on Monday, we had a conversation with him, and that was when we heard about the infectivity test and the possibility of people carrying the virus without necessarily being infectious. Uh, we had a lot of people asking questions after we spoke to him, and so we thought that it would be wise to have him on at the same time as Dr. Bertha so that we can finalize and really uh, get to the nitty-gritty of this particular issue on what exactly he meant and what the way forward is. And so, uh, Eugene Sebastian Arthur, good morning to you as well. Eugene, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you okay. Hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you for joining us as well. Hello, Eugene. Okay. Uh, can you hear us, by the way? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Okay, so let's just quickly go back to Monday. Yes, I can. Um, and the conversation that we had about the infectivity test. Uh, just briefly on it so that we can have Dr. Betha also come in. Because remember you talked about uh, the possibility of infections and, you know, uh, explained a bit about how someone may carry the virus but could still not be infectious. If you can just summarize what you said on Monday for us, because a lot of people are still asking for further explanation on that yeah i think um thank you very much and um, good morning to all your viewers mm. um i i was actually basically talking about so i've been um, on interviews where people talk about recoveries okay that yes. um, the recovery rating and is really low and um, slow for the matter and um, that is why i came in so my point was that we seen this slow recovery rates mm. being reported because of the way we are um, actually conducting our tests to um, have people go out there as recovered. So the first thing I talked about was um, the, um, what actually shows that someone has recovered. And okay. the first one is symptoms. So you look at the symptoms, and if these individuals have subsided in their symptoms, that's the first point. And then we we'll go ahead to test them. And again, these are people who are um, symptomatic. So you test them with a PCR, you do two um, different tests, 24 hours apart, and then when they come out both negative, then you can declare them as um, recovered, and they can go home and join society. Now, what I was saying is that with a PCR, 
the caveat is that you actually test the genome or some part of the virus, mm -hmm. okay, genome. And when you do this, it does not really give you information about infectivity, but okay. it is so good so that it can tell you that, okay, this person has very low viral yield and cannot transmit the virus. Mm. Now, when, when I mention infectivity assay, I'm coming from the lab standpoint. When I'm in the lab and I'm going to do an infectivity assay where I'll put the virus or I'll isolate virus from samples taken from patients and put on cells mm -hmm. and then see cytopathic effects, which shows that the virus is able to destroy the cells, okay, or yeah. to grow in the cell culture. Then I can say the virus is infectious. This is where you can say that, okay, now I have the viral RNA present, so I have PCR positive, mm -hmm. but I have negative for infectivity, which means that though the viral RNA is present, these people cannot infect other people. Okay. That is the summary of what I was saying. However, let me just mention that the test I just described is very tedious. It, takes, it, it won't take you less than uh, uh, maybe three days or four days to do, mm. you know? Uh, maximum five days, minimum three days to be doing um, such ex uh, experiments. So when it comes to public health standpoint to make decisions, I don't think that is very important. Okay. However, I was only clearing the air to make people understand that when you do the RT uh, the RT PCR that is being done in Gucci and all the other places, it is enough. Okay, but uh, because you can get a positive PCR and still the person is non-infectious or the person is probably non-infectious. You can't really let the person go, okay. you know, because the PCR is saying the pictures. You can't tell with the PCR. Okay. All right. So, so then in that case, are you saying that we should start considering adding the infectivity test to the PCR as well? <laughs> no, no. Okay. Just wanted to be clear on that. You know, okay. Uh, no, that, that is a problem. We can't do that test for everyone individual. Otherwise, we're going to have a problem with the backlog. And you know what? Yeah. Already. With a backlog, people are saying that data okay. is being manipulated and all the. We can't do that. No, that is not a place to go. And okay. essentially, so we can do that to just do our um, studies, to study the virus in general, but not for public health policies. All right. All right. Okay. Well, that, that's the clarification that we needed. And I remember that day we also asked Dr. Bertha what she made of um, you know his accession and so for a lot of people they were asking that did it mean that then we have to now you know get rid of the PCR and start doing the effectivity test I like that uh, Sebastian says that it's not going no, to be no, that possible is not a public yeah choice. yeah okay but Dr. Bertha do you have any add-ons um, just before we wrap up on this particular conversation so we move on um, to the rest Okay. South Korea study. Like, if you're going to do one test on the, the second, if you're going to do an infectivity test on the repeat, then why didn't you do it on the first? I mean, I would only accept that as realistic and practical. If the first time the person tested positive, you actually run this test to see, I mean, what if at that time too, the virus was not infective and that you tested the PCR and it was positive? Why do you feel that suddenly for a virus that has no treatment to kill the virus, suddenly in two weeks, if you test and the infectivity is gone, then suddenly it changed from being infectious to non-infectious. So that, that would be my only caveat, that I would prefer to do it when you do it on both samples. Then I know that, yes, it's changed from being infectious to infectious. I like data and scientific, you know, I, I, I won't act that. You did it the first time for infectivity, and then the second time, when it's you, it's and it's not a viable. You say that it's changed. Okay, all right. Then I, I think that we can put this particular topic to rest um, at this point. And so, thank you so much, Sebastian, uh, for agreeing to do this, and also uh, thanks for joining us on COVID nineteen. Now we'll move on to our next question. So I read earlier uh, a, a news report about governments possibly meeting on Friday. Uh, to have a final round of uh, engagements with experts on how they can proceed to start easing restrictions. And I want to ask both of you, if you were among these experts, what kind of advice would you give to government in terms of what they should do um, and you know, measures they should put in place before they start easing the restrictions? 
Dr. Betha, you go first, or Dr. Newman? I'll start with you, Dr. Dr. Betha. Dr. Newman, go first. So okay. <laughs> Dr. Newman. Dr. Newman. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I would, I would, there are two things I would suggest. One, we know we need to open churches. We need to open schools. So before we do that, we should have a period of training for the teachers and the people who are going to handle the students. You know, we do when we do So that we are sure that they are all on the same page. All of them understand what the virus is, what it would do, uh, understand how to prevent it. And also, um, they are going to, I would say dress your heads out, but they have to think through what they're going to do exactly with the students when they come to school. Model everything, put everything down so that it becomes the standard, so that every school decides to follow. Mm. So if they get to understand and there are laid down procedures and processes to enforce what they understand, then we can open the school up gradually. Maybe not every student at a time, but maybe the shift system may help to reduce the number of students in the various schools. So that is what I would suggest. Okay. That before they take any decision about opening churches and schools, pastors and leaders of various churches, there should be some training for them, some orientation for them, so that we, we know we are all on the same page. Because there are some pastors who do not believe that this virus is real. There are some pastors who have assigned all kinds of meanings to this season. And because of that, they are not likely to follow anything that the government is, is, is to put in place. And so there should be a period of orientation and training, even for church leaders and also school leaders. They should be able to think through the whole process. If we open the church, what and what and what are we going to do on a daily basis to ensure that we cannot prevent the, uh, the infection entirely, but reduce the number of infections. And if someone in the church or in a school has the virus and it starts to spread, what and what exactly are we going to do to be able to minimize the spread, reporting and all that. How do we handle those who have the virus? What are some of the things we are going to put in place to the person from stigmatization and whatever? It has to be well thought through. You know, not leave a people, just say it on TV and give some instructions on TV and expect everybody to follow. So that is the first bit. Then also sanctions for not following the procedures. If, for example, a pastor or a um, a school administrator or someone decides that in after all the and all the measures, they see what what want to do. What are the sanctions? What exactly uh, uh, can be done to make sure that uh, these people they, they they comply with whatever uh, uh, directive that that will be given? So I think that before any of that thing is done, that is the advice I would give. That okay. we need to, you know, figure out exactly what we are going to do in terms of containing them. And if there's some infection, what exactly are we supposed to do? Then also this training must be must be regular. Okay. So maybe some monthly uh, reports and, 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 and orientation, it will help. Okay. That, that is what I was... Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, what about you, Dr. Bertha? And we're also putting into consideration other social gatherings as well. Uh, because we know that as it stands, we're told you cannot have more than 25 people um, at one spot. We still have to wear a nose mask and all of that. And so if we should go ahead to uh, ease the restrictions, what advice would you give? Well, I think Dr. Newman has raised very valid points mm. about educating people, especially the leaders in the schools, making yeah. sure that we know how we're going to manage situations, stigma, etc., the one word I would like to add is vigilance. And uh, to be vigilance, 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 which is one of like the primary issues with any public health intervention and with COVID-19 in general, which is vigilance to find every possible case and contain it. Mm. Do, we, are the, do the churches know how to recognize when someone in their midst has um, an, out, an infection that can potentially lead to an outbreak? Do the schools know when to recognize if a child is at risk? And I'm saying vigilance for good reason. Um, so China has some few outbreaks going, even though they closed down and tested everybody. As of this morning, they said they've tested about 6.6 .6 million people. Mm. Um, you look at South Korea, a nation that had the disease under control this morning, they're reporting sort of like a small outbreak. 
And then there was a church in Houston here in the United States, um, specifically the Holy Ghost Catholic Church. Um, they reopened, they had closed in the first week of May, and they reopened just about five days ago. And the priest has died, and five people who either live in the house with the priest or go to church have tested positive, and so the church permanently closed. And, and so, I mean, the priest died of pneumonia. So clearly, he's probably infected some people. And if the church had a way of knowing that this priest was carrying the SARS-CoV-2 virus, it would have helped a lot. So for me, my big word is going to be vigilance, watching out and considering the fact that the disease can be spread by asymptomatic people. Actually, it's most infectious when people don't have any symptoms. That vigilance is going to be a challenge. So we just have to brace ourselves for the second part of the war. If everybody, you know, if we reopen churches and schools. All right. I mean, still talking about that, should we still yes. put a cap on I the number of people? Cap. Sorry. But should we still put a cap on the number of people that can gather at one place? Because in South Africa like this, um, they're looking at easing the restrictions uh, for people to start attending churches and mosques. But they are saying that they cannot have more than 50 people um, gathering at one place. So as much as they're easing the restrictions, they're still limiting the numbers um, to a certain point. Should we also consider some of those? Exactly. And a lot of people are starting, I don't know if it's a rule, but the mm. few that I've read, they're talking about starting at 25% capacity. How the church is going to be de determined who the 25% is, maybe send a message. I mean, they may have to segment it that maybe all those who live in this part of town, I mean, Accra is divided into districts anyway. So it might have to be a district by district um, basis on getting people to come to church that some people it would have to be lower numbers definitely but you remember in 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 new york i mean in the u.s um the mayor of new york at a point you know gave a rule that only 75 percent of a section of people could set, uh, you know could step out at a point and all of that but then the numbers increased and the infections also increased as well so don't you think that even if we're still putting a cap on the number of people that can gather and still going ahead to ease restrictions. We might not experience a resurgence. Um, I don't know. It's hard to tell. Like, I keep going back to 1918 that nobody thought there would be a resurgence, but there was a spike in the fall, which was even worse than the first one. So I hope that's not what we experience, but it will be difficult to predict this one. All right. Dr. Newman, you were saying something. We'll take a few questions from our viewers as well. Uh, for the schools, for the schools, right, they, almost every secondary school, especially secondary schools, almost every secondary school has uh, a dispensary. And so the dispensary can be engaged to uh, be the point where uh, they can do some, uh, some surveillance and also... They may, they may be the point through which the Ministry of Health and other people involved uh, uh, to reach out to the students. And so if the dispensaries are empowered, it's going to help. Then also probably when they open, the week when they open, they should have a general orientation for all the students on COVID-19 and, and what, what they can do. Because not every student has even heard about COVID-19 and not every student even understands what it is. And so in that week, when they open, they should have a general orientation for all the students so that they, they understand, they know that everybody at least uh, has had it and knows, knows what to do. Okay. Okay. All right, cool. Well, we'll take a few right. questions. Um, okay. We'll take, well, before we take a few questions from um, our viewers, are you ready, Anita? Okay, let's go yes. ahead. Well, this one says, good morning, Brella and Anita. Please ask Dr. Bertha that does the virus affect the sense of taste? And this is from one of our loyal viewers, David Kweku Agbemava in Qatar. Okay, so um, it affects the sense of smell, but your taste is actually a combination of smell and taste and, and the food that's actually on your tongue. For example, if you get a bad cold, um, you notice that when you put food, in, first of all, you won't be able to smell very well when you get a bad cold. And secondly, when you try to eat, you realize that the food doesn't taste the same. So actually, all the things we taste is a combination of smell versus what the food does on our tongue as well. But I must caution that this loss of smell, it's not unique to COVID-19. 
anytime I get a cold, I experience it. And a lot of people experience it for about two to three days. It just happens to be one of the signs and symptoms of, um, of COVID-19. Okay. Okay, this one says, good morning, beautiful ladies. You guys are doing a massive job. Thank you. Well, my question is, we're told to wear a nose mask, which is very good, while at the same time, we are to breathe out carbon dioxide and take back oxygen. Won't it cause any problem in the consistent use of the mask as respiration is concerned? And this is from Godwin. Yes, let me, let me take that question because there's actually like a WhatsApp uh, message or video or something going around scaring people about this carbon dioxide thing. So let me explain. When you take oxygen, it combines with carbohydrates and produces water and carbon dioxide. Now, you realize that most face masks, they don't, don't provide a tight seal. The mask I showed you the other time that I wore with the cartridges, that one is like almost 100% sealing off your face and no. But the one that people wear regularly, there's space on the sides of the of the of the ear, there's space under the the chin, there's space here. So there's no way carbon dioxide is going to build up. I must admit, um, if you wear the N95, that one is supposed to seal your nose, and that's why the healthcare workers use it. A lot of people feel suffocated after wearing it for a while, so um, they they will switch it out or take a break or something. But the normal face masks and cloth masks that people wear has so many spaces around it that carbon dioxide is not going to build up and you have free flow of oxygen into the, the space around the nose. All right. We'll take another one. Do okay, we have any so more? This yes. one says, can the virus travel to the lower lungs during deep breathing exercises such as during yoga? Well, I mean, that question is almost like the pathophysiology of infection. Yes, it travels directly down into the lower lungs, but that's only if you are exposed to it. If you're doing yoga at home and you're not exposed to any virus, there's no way that it's going to, like, if your immediate environment doesn't have the virus, you can deep breathe as much as you want and it won't have any issues. You know, you will not heal the virus. Okay, now, now one more thing I wanted to ask. So we were talking about comorbidity earlier today. And, um, you know, one thing that came to mind was the fact that if you have some comorbidities and you catch the virus, then it worsens your situation. But we also know that once you don't have any other underlying health uh, condition and you catch coronavirus, it leads to other health conditions as well. Could you catch other illnesses like maybe hypertension? Could it lead to some of these very serious health conditions as well? Like you mean once you get the once viral infection? Once you get COVID, infection, yes. You have, yes. But, oh, yeah. That, when we say multi-organ involvement, we're actually saying the virus affects several other organs. So you can start from the brain all the way down to your legs. For the brain, it causes confusion. Um, it causes people to have falls. It's been known to cause strokes even in young people, um, and a lot of children, in fact, 97% of children will not present with a fever and a cough. They will just have severe abdominal pain and vomiting. And one child in the UK actually had an open abdomen because they thought he had appendicitis. It was just COVID-19. Hmm. A lot of adults would also present with nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. It's all COVID-19. Um, some people present with um, acute acute renal failure some people present with acute renal failure Sorry. okay <laughs> um some people this is acute renal failure for some people um then the blue toes a lot of people are getting clots in the lungs um and then the worst part of it all is the hearts and what is called um myocarditis in children and then it causes those little cerebral um, coronary vessels to open up and cause um, aneurysms like I showed you the other time. Yeah. So, yes, this disease causes a lot. In fact, I think at this point, it has become well established. Contrary to initial when we said, oh, fever and cough, it's become well established that COVID-19 is a multi-system illness, meaning it involves multiple systems. And in the latter stages, all these systems would fail 
and that becomes the ultimate cause of death. All right, Dr. Newman, final words before we wrap up on this segment. Any advice for us? Uh, I think that every decision we're taking, we have to think through, work it through, rehearse it, and so that we can implement it. Because every, every decision we, we take, we shouldn't be in a rush. We should take our time, work it through, think through, so that we don't have unnecessary deaths. Because some deaths may just happen because we're just careless, not because we, we couldn't have done anything about it. So I think that whatever the decisions uh, will be, we should really think through and work the processes you know, through and see whether uh, it is workable on a daily basis. Otherwise, we can cause unnecessary deaths. All right. Thank you so much for spending right. time with us on air today. Dr. Bertha Sewa Ayi is an infectious disease specialist and our clinical psychologist, Dr. Newman Arthur. Have a good day. Now, yeah, there's a, a mother with a 14-year-old child with special needs. Now, she also is a teacher of children with special needs, and today she gets to interact with us to educate other parents who may have children with special needs on how they can also um, you know, help their kids while schools are shut down. We'll be back. It's COVID-19 360. What's life like as a parent with a child with special needs? Now, schools have been shut down for some months now. And as other children get the opportunity to enjoy e-learning and also enjoy the presence of their parents whilst they're learning, what is it like for a parent with a child who is autistic or may have other needs as well? And so today we're being joined by a parent with a 14-year-old autistic daughter. And she will tell us what life has been like for her and how she's managed to educate her child during this time. And so she is Madame Mary Amwa Kufo. Good morning. And you're welcome to COVID-19 360. Good morning. How easy has it been or difficult has it been um, since schools shut down? Honestly, it has not been easy at all for us. It, you know, it was like our whole world came to a complete halt mm. because we went to school on Friday and she loves routine. She thrives on routine. Mm -hmm. So whatever needs to happen next, she needs to understand. And so we went to school on Friday. She knows Saturday and Sundays, no school. Yeah. She actually says that Saturday, Sundays, no school. Then she was waiting to go to school on Monday. And that was when the announcement, announcement was made on Sunday that, you know, we're not going to go as a result of COVID-19. Yeah. The, the first week was very difficult. And I think perhaps maybe from us as parents, we're very uncertain, we're very kind of stressed because we didn't know what was going to happen. Mm. So being around her with all these emotions didn't help at all. Mm. In fact, it was during this time, the first time I've ever seen my daughter being destructive. She actually broke two of our chairs at the sitting room. Wow. This has never happened. Yes. And this is from her not being too happy because she couldn't go to school? Yes, I think for her, she, like I said earlier, she thrives on routine. On routine. So she knows Monday, I wake up at 7 o'clock or 6.30. By 8.30, we are at the center. I go in for my brain gym. I have my tabletop activity. I take my water break at 11. Yeah. I have my second you know, tabletop activity. 1 o'clock, I come out for break. Two o'clock, I'm out with my teachers going through the day. Three o'clock, mommy picks me up and then we get home. When we get home, 4.30, 5 o'clock, she takes her bath. 5.30, she's having her dinner, mm. then TV time, then family time, then back to bed. This has been the routine for so many years. Mm -hmm. And here, suddenly, from morning up to three o'clock, there isn't much happening. We were worried around her. And I, she got very agitated, and she started being very distractive. Well, now I think she's now getting to understand that somehow this is going to be, you mm. know, my life, or you know, it's going to be like this for some time. So she's gradually getting into the routine of being home yeah. and listening to us. But in the first four weeks, it, it was, it was not difficult. Easy. Could you not repeat some of, uh, you know, the routine? So if she knows that maybe between. 9 and 10, she has to study. Could you not at least, um, you know, create that setting at home so that it doesn't look too different from her being in school? Okay, so in her mind, 
This is not a place I have my therapy between 8 to 3 o'clock, Monday to Friday, mm -hmm. okay? Number two, mommy is not a teacher that teaches me from this time to this time on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So why this sudden change? I think that was something that was difficult. So like a lot of our children on the spectrum, routine and schedule works excellent for them. So for instance, this is my um, um, pet speeches of what she needs to do. Okay. Even if she doesn't have the words, you know, we have some of these in pictures where she just gets to choose, okay? Mm. Now we have all these done for her, things she needs to do at um, the center and then what she needs to do at home. Here we are, all of a sudden, mommy becomes my teacher between 8, 30, 9 o'clock to 2. That mm. was very difficult for her to understand. Even taking the instructions for me during those times was very difficult. Yeah. I had to constantly assure her that, look, we are not going to go to the center now. You need to understand that and you know get into the routine but sincerely it was not easy okay now i, I know that you're also a, uh, a a parent but also you have a background in teaching children with special needs and so what i want to find out and i'm sure a lot of parents will want to know so if they also find themselves in a similar situation maybe you've been able to adjust how did you manage to get her to adjust to the new conditions and what can they also do okay so first of all like my husband and i discussed we needed to be very calm. Mm. We needed to be very calm because everything was so uncertain. Are we going to go back to work? You know, mm. things just came to a complete halt. So the first thing we did that I think really helped us was we had to be very calm around her. Okay. And two, we had to reassure her that regardless, all is going to be all right. I called her teacher to talk to her and she was very happy. Mm. You know, like, you know, Nanaya, we are not going to go to school in the next few months, but, you know, I'm going to be here for you. She called, and then we have to explain. At a point, we have to get what we call social stories, okay? Okay. Social stories, you know, breaking down what you want to teach her into mm. picture form. And okay. then we have to also assure her. I think after the first four weeks, gradually she, she started getting calmer. Another thing we also noticed, which also made it very difficult for us, she was not sleeping. Mm. I think because she was anxious mm -hmm. and she didn't know what was happening, she was not sleeping. Mm. And that was also very difficult for us. So I think the first time, for the first four or five days, throughout the whole night, she was not sleeping. Mm -hmm. But again, like I said, we became very calm around her. We also got to reassure her that, look, everything is going to be all right. And then I also noticed that, look, around this time, I have a lot of time, you know, you know, in my mm, hands. Yeah. Why don't I use this time to engage her as much as I can at the kitchen? Mm. Not necessarily going through the academics, you know, okay. but what I call self-help skills. She loves to take a walk outside. So we said, okay, five o'clock every day, she's going to get 45 to an hour, you know, walk every day. She loved that routine. Mm. We got her to help us to wash the dishes, you know, count the tomatoes when I come from the market, repacked everything and put in the fridge. Okay. So we got her to, you know, we got her to do more than we used to do before. I see. So she's very much engaged and I think that is helping us to keep her calm. That must be interesting. Let's quickly take a look at some videos of, um, you know, how she's managed uh, to get Nanaya, that's her name, I believe. Yes to also adjust. And when we come back, we still have some more questions. Is it possible uh, to engage them in e-learning as well? And so take a look at this, we'll be back. Okay, so, so that's Nanaya at home with her mother. And this looks like, um, this is when she wakes up in the morning. And so here are a few things that she does before she um, proceeds to the day's work. So you can see that she's watering uh, the, the garden at her house. And you're saying that some of these things are what keeps them engaged, at least, so that they can also adjust to the new routine as well. But while she's doing this, I mean, this is just for a period. After that, there still has to be that opportunity to study. Would you advise on e-learning? And if that's the case, are they offering such opportunities um, for students with special needs? 
Yes, I think you, you, can, you can equally also engage your child. But this is where parent training really comes in. Mm. If the parents are not trained, what kind of activities do you engage your child in? So, for instance, we are still teaching here to um, count and add. Okay. This is a board that we have at home. We mm. bought this from our occupational therapist, okay? Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, as you can see. Okay. And then, yes, so on a daily basis, I sit with her, and then we try to identify the colors. We make some, um, we count this either from the big to the smallest or okay. from the smallest to the biggest. We use, you know, to identify the colors and all that. And then I say, okay, yeah, mm. can you give me five of the knots? And then I'll add three. How many do we have? So yeah. these are some kind of um, academic activities, but it, it, in a more informal way, uh -huh. okay? Uh -huh. Now, also notice that she has a lot of sensory issues. If she has to do something, you need to engage the mind, the hands, more or less the whole body. This really puts, you know, a health set to do that, getting all the inputs okay. at the same time. Now, if the parent is not trained, how do they carry out some of these activities? Mm -hmm. Now, with a child with autism, we may have difficulty with um, communication. You may have difficulty with social interaction. You may have difficulty with sensory integration and all these things. Where on the spectrum is your child? Yeah. How much can your child understand? What kind of learning styles do you need as a parent to be able to teach your child? Mm -hmm. Yeah, is very visual and auditory as well. So anytime I need to talk to her, I need to use more of pictures and more of words okay. to add meaning. Sometimes even having to learn a few signs, mm. you know, to teach her. And that's um, sign language. So if the parent hasn't been... Uh, involved in this child's upbringing. Mm -hmm. This is one of the most difficult, you know, um, um, times for them. I just want to put on record that there's a lot of um, uh, resources online right okay. now. Okay. A lot. So maybe this is time for parents to take advantage of the time, download some of these things, and then read to update yourself to be able to support your child. Right. I know a lot of schools are going online. Mm -hmm. My child, for instance, does not like to sit at one place and watch television. As I talk to you right now, she's jumping, going, mm -hmm. you know, up. She will not even sit. But there are also some children on the spectrum who would sit down and would be very glued to the television. Mm -hmm. Of course, you need somebody who would sit next to this child to be able to go through the materials being put online, yeah. you know, so that they can access it. These are very important. Of course, like they say, it's no ordinary time. Exactly. And we need, yes, we need to learn and be able to support them. But let's just say I can't afford this material that you just showed us. Uh, maybe the only time my child gets to learn with these tools is when she's in school. And um, maybe I can't afford regular internet for her to log on to the online sites. How do I manage? What can I do? What, what are some of the things at home I can take advantage of to teach her? Okay, so, so maybe your child loves to move. You can have a ball. You can do a throwing activity. We can do a kicking activity. Um, one thing I did with you, I think about a month ago, was to use a chalk and draw a straight line. And we were, because she loves to run. Instead of walking, she loves to run mm. all the time when you are out. She rather just want to run. So I drew lines on the floor, and she was required to walk on that straight line. In fact, when we started, she was just laughing at us, mm -hmm. you know, like, what are you trying to do? Are you yeah. okay, mommy? Yeah. You know, but as we did that with her, gradually she, she was enjoying it. Mm -hmm. You can throw ball, you know, she can, the child can be at the kitchen with you. You can, do not leave them supervised, because these are new skills that you are, you know, teaching them. Taking them out for a walk doesn't demand you to have something, you know, in place. You can just take five or ten minutes, take them within the neighborhood. Another thing too, you will never wear the mask. I have tried mm. and tried. I haven't given up anyway. Mm -hmm. But should we require to go back to school? Yeah. And she's not wearing the mask. And she's not wearing this because she has a lot of sensory issue okay even when i wear it she wants to take it off mm. you understand and i try to teach her you know we we it's a must for us to wear it to be able to 
go out. So yeah. what happens? It's not going to wear the mask. So what? these are things that... Mm. What about um, self-help groups? Do we have any of them existing and should mothers or parents consider joining some of these groups? Because maybe it will be better to learn some of these things in a group than individually. Yes, there are a lot of self-help groups, especially on WhatsApp. Mm. Um, we do have the Autism Society of Ghana WhatsApp group. That is ASOC. Um, if you call me, I'll be able to put you on that platform. That's one of the support groups that we have. Parents do share. There's another active group on, on WhatsApp that we are in. That is also called the Warrior Moms. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think we have about two groups you know, of Warrior Moms. Every single day we share of things that parents are doing at home that other parents can equally uh, learn from. We share our success stories, we share our failures, we share our fears, we share our difficulties, and, you know, all that. So it's like a lifeline, you know, in these mm. times. Of course, we try to also reassure the parents that, look, you know, this would also be over, you know. Definitely. It's just one day at a time. This is not going to be forever. Definitely, you know, there will be an end to to this. How do I manage if I still have to go to work and still manage to take care of my child? What do I do? This is where sometimes you need family and friends. It's extremely important. But they For may instance, not understand you your child as well as you might. Exactly, but this is where we also need to open up. So, for instance, we do have a lot of parents who don't want other people to know that they have a child with special needs. Mm. But you cannot do it alone. You cannot, even when we have to go to the center, on Saturdays and Sundays, your child would be with you. I'm sure you have certain social engagements, some you know Saturdays or some Sundays where you have to go to work. So whether you like it or not, there must be somebody you can confide in, you know, and open up to them and teach them gradually. Let them know because if it's a child with special needs, every child is so different, mm -hmm. especially if they are on the spectrum. You need to open up to let people know what your child can tolerate, what they cannot, you know. Some children have feeding issues, you know, they will not eat certain uh, food because of the texture or the smells. If you have to leave this child with a friend or if somebody needs to babysit, how do they feed this child? What do they give this child? My child is on a strict diet, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cannot take sugary food. She cannot take any kind of food, processed food. Her food needs to be very organic. Mm. If I have to travel, what do I have to do? So you, you can't just say that you want to do it all by yourself. You need to open up regardless. And this is where the parent support groups does help. Mm -hmm. You know, we encourage you that you are not alone. Don't feel shy about this. You haven't done anything wrong. Open up. There are some good people around. And yeah. like I was saying, two, three weeks ago, yeah, I was shouting at night. The next day, I had to actually go to my next door and say, look, you heard some noise last night. Mm -hmm. We're going through some tantrums. You know, if it happens like that, Please just keep us in your prayers. Okay. It's not that we are making noise, you know, to get you from sleeping. No, I didn't have control over this. And, you know, the gentleman really understood. understood. And so the next day they called on me and said, hi, is she now? Is she okay? I saw her taking a stroll around and I said, yes, it's getting better. You understand? Mm. I am sure that when I had not said anything, because this wasn't happening before. Yeah. So why is this woman's child making noise at night? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they can draw their own conclusion. Yeah. But, but you see, in this case, Nanaya is autistic. What about children with other kinds of needs? Not necessarily autism, but other needs as well. Do we handle them the same way, or is each case peculiar? I think it depends on the child's difficulty. So, for instance, if I have a child with cerebral palsy, where I know uh, movement may be you know, challenging. Mm -hmm. Remember that for a child with cerebral palsy, they may not necessarily have cognitive issues. And so whatever you say to them, they do understand. Yeah. It makes it even easier. But like I said, you need to have a schedule. Don't just call them out of the blue, expect them to learn. Mm. Let them know ahead of time, okay, we're having a free time, but when it's 11 o'clock to 11.30, we're going to have writing time, or we're going to have 
watching TV time, or we're going to do this activity, counting yeah. activity, or whatever it is. Just plan something. Make it very fun. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Make it very fun. And I'm sure that they would enjoy it. All right. We would have loved to meet Nanaya and probably see her try something. But like you said, she's busy uh, with herself. So maybe another time. If it's possible, we'll do that. But thank you so much, Madam Mary Amwakufo. It's, it's been very enlightening uh, speaking to you. Thank you so And all much. the very best. And I hope that we've been able to help some parents out there. She's a mother of a 14-year-old autistic uh, daughter, and she gave some um, advice on how you can better manage your child if he or she also has some special needs. We've had a lot of messages coming in, so we'll take a few before we wrap up. All right, this one says, after COVID-19, media general deserve awards i mean plenty awards i agree to that you guys are doing absolutely fantastic with COVID 19 coverage and i'm learning every blessed day this is from emperor victor selassie in kumasi thank you so much emperor good morning we're grateful to our health practitioners and the media for their work in kevin the spread of COVID 19. i think offering advice on how we can stop the spread of COVID 19 is good However, don't you think that pastors, religious leaders, and heads of schools have the required intelligence and information also to manage their institutions? Is it possible for you guys to think about the efforts of religious leaders? All right, this is from Brian in Achimota. Okay, hello, elegant Bella Mundi and Anita Kufu, the lady with the charm. <laughs> I want to know if our recoveries are subtracted from the cases anytime we get an update on the recovery. So if we have a total uh, figure of 7,017 like we do now, and if our recovery stands at 2,173, we subtracted from it, and then the rest are, are active cases. And when we take the deaths from it as well, those are, are active cases. And so there you have it. Okay, hi, TV3, big ups. I am of the opinion that at this particular stage, education is the easiest way to deal with this. Each individual should at this stage be on the awareness level of the ICU worker. We are three months into this and people don't even know how to use a nose mask. Hmm. That's um, a very serious one. And Interesting. the education will still continue like we're doing right here on COVID-19 360. We keep you rightly informed and our experts also give you all the details you need as well. My name is Anita Ikea Akufo. It's been an absolute pleasure coming your way every day like we do with my sister. Of course, Bella <laughs> Mundi. And tomorrow we'll be speaking to some more Ghanaian stranded in China. And so make sure you don't miss COVID-19 360. It's been a pleasure and we'll see you tomorrow. God willing.